Hello, humans. Look at this cup that I found back there that matches my sweatshirt. I was so excited. <laughs> okay, so I'm Emily, and I am a researcher with LVR. We're a subgroup of the Communications Design Group, which is a research uh, lab funded by SAP. And this is my camera. It is made of foam core and hot glue and duct tape. And it is here to inspire you that you do not need millions of dollars to make VR video. And I'm going to show you how. So, oh, all right. Whoop, there we go. This is LVR. This is our little elevator. I just want to show it off. Um, so this is not the easiest way to make VR video in 3D. This is not the fastest way. This is not the cheapest or the computationally easiest way to do it. But it is the prettiest product. Um, and also, this will probably be, this whole workflow will probably be pointless and outdated in like six months, so enjoy it while it lasts. Um, you start, at least I start with 14 cameras, 14 GoPros, most people use GoPros. Um, you shoot in the closest thing you can get to a square, which currently is 3x4 in HD at 60 frames per second, just because that's the only thing you can get out of a GoPro. And then you use this thing called... 360 Cam Man. 360 Cam Man is an importing software made by 360 Heroes, and it is great and also terrible, like all the other software that we use to make this stuff. Um, this is so that you do not have to hand import everything and relabel it. That's all it does. It's fantastic. I love it. It saves me so much time. Because you get this, and then you get tons and tons of videos, and they're all labeled, and you are so excited because everything tells you what camera it came out of, and you can't miss sort it. Because if you miss sort, 3D, uh, 3D video for VR, you stitch together the worst looking thing ever. Organization is good for you. And then you put it into something called Video Stitch. Video Stitch is a software that has gone through two iterations now. The second iteration is much better. This is the first. And you take out a still image from every camera, one frame out of the thousands and thousands and thousands of frames that you took. And you put it into PT GUI. This is PT GUI Pro. And you trust, you trust PT GUI. You just push the align images button and everything works perfectly. You don't have to put hours and hours of time into hand aligning which pixels are which because it works perfectly the first time, I promise. Yeah, it does. <laughs> um, did I skip anything? No. This is what hand aligning looks like. And if you want it to be pretty, this is what you're going to have to do. Um, so then after you have put all these dots on all the pixels that go together, you have to export a calibration. A calibration is just a, um, a file that tells the, um, the batch processor where to put all those pixels from all those cameras. So they just say, this camera goes here and here and here, and the, it is morphed in this way and all these things. So you just take this out, it gets, you give a file, and you give it to another program. The problem with this process is that one of these programs is one indexed, and one of them is zero indexed. So you have to have fancy, very, very special, if you lose them, you will go insane post-it notes, so that you will never put the wrong videos into the wrong program. I really wish it was like, Evens are always right and odds are always left, but no, it's not true. Sorry, it's not that easy. <laughs> um, so then comes the actual like stitching phase. The stitching phase starts with synchronization. Synchronization can be done with audio or motion or flash. Audio works the best. These convolution algorithms just line up all the audio for waveforms. It's not that hard. Um, also, this totally works the first time every time. It never messes you up and you trust it and it totally ruins all of your footage. That has never happened to me. It's totally trustworthy. Then you do exposure compensation. Exposure compensation just means that the light coming into every camera is different, and how you adjust all of that light has to be done individually for every camera. I would advise not having to do this at all by just closing every window in the space that you're in and just lighting it very evenly. That's the best way to do exposure compensation, but it doesn't always work that way. Then you do stabilization. If you move the camera, there are ways to stabilize the video so that the person who is putting your headset on is not like getting all knocked around. And then this is the best part of Video Stitch 2 is this little enable button. 
Because it used to be you would have to make two different video stitch files and put all of the videos into, into uh, uh, sorry, all of the video stitch files and all the video from one eye would have to go in one and all the video from the other eye would have to go into another. But we don't have to do that anymore. You can just make one calibration, stick all the videos in, and then when you want to export a left eye, you just disable all the right eye videos for, you know, and disable all the left eye videos. So makes it much easier. This is what it looks like when you get, um, after you batch export a left eye and a right eye, you then, by the, by the way, this takes forever. This is the longest part of the process. Um, and I have four graphics cards working on this all the time. Um, if you want to see my beautiful Titan Blacks, I'll show you pictures because they're gorgeous. They're my babies. Um, so you end up with this. This is called top bottom 3D. The top is the left eye, the bottom is the right eye. If you ever mix that up, you will totally ruin everything. Um, when you, you try to export 4K, but 4K, you think, like, oh, 4K is going to be gorgeous. Except I have to stretch 4K all the way around your face, and then it makes it like 1K, and you're like, oh, it looks really pixelated. And I'm like, uh-huh, that's, that's accurate. Um, so then once you, you put this into Premiere, this is Premiere we're looking at, you can edit it like normal video, except for the fact that if you put titles or effects or anything over this, it is not projected the same way that the video is projected. This is called network rectangular projection. And there's no way to get Premiere to do an echo rectangular projection on a title. If you know how to do that with a plugin, I will give you money. <laughs> um, this is an echo rectangular projection. Echo rectangular. We would like it to be a cube projection because it wastes less pixels. If you look at this, the thing that you are, most of what you're looking at is in the center of either the top or the bottom. So a lot of pixels are being stretched across the, the top edge and the bottom edge, and a lot of the pixels get wasted. So echo rectangular, we call them greedy, but uh, there's other projections that you could use, but this is just the one that we're stuck with for the moment. Um, also, cube is also something you would be stuck with until we have like an actually native spherical video format that you can save in instead of an MP4. Um, so you do all this work, and it takes forever, and maybe one of your cameras died in the middle of shooting, and this is what happens when that, when that glorious thing, because it will happen every time, because we shoot long-form content, so this is our talk show, and on this lovely day, the bottom camera just decided that they didn't want to play anymore, so then you just start getting more and more and more black space, and this video actually ends with all being black and then just one little square of two people being like, sorry, we have to go because all the cameras are dying by, and then it just goes black. <laughs> so these are the problems that you currently go through making spherical video. I have like more, way more technical stuff in here, but I'm gonna skip it. Um, but this is all the like invisible art of editing, right? Like b back when people cut film by hand, if they were really good at it, you never noticed it. That's like the, the beauty of making something and editing it. Um, but the idea that you can make this intellectual montage and of an abstracted flat media which represents a place, and like, I guess it, it speaks metaphorically of transporting someone to, into the story. We talk about that a lot in film. But I don't have to do that with 360 video. I can actually put you in a place. I don't have to transport you anywhere. So we put all this work into it just so that when you put it on, it feels natural right away. Um, and also, like I said at the beginning, like eventually none, you'll, you won't have to do any of this stuff. This will all be done by the camera hardware and by like one software program that you just magically imported into and everything is perfect. Right now that's not true, but it will be soon. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, great job, Emily. Do we have questions for? Her? Let's do. Let's do a lively Q and A. We got one right here. Talk loud, or do you want a mic? I'll give you a mic. Yes. So, is this on? Can you hear me? Okay. Um, color is great. They have an automatic uh, stitching uh, thing that is similar to the one that you like align images in PTGUI. Um, the problem is that 
you have very little control over what color gives you. So if you want fast and you want mono and you want it right now, color is great. If you want mono, color is like the perfect thing for you to use. Idea that I can then evoke. It's kind of good to have both. It's kind of good to have both. Just to go back and forth. If you want something like if I want something quick, just to prove the concept real quick, I can put it through that. Video stitch. Video stitch is the, the prettier version. Like you can get really pretty 3D out of video stitch in PTGUI, yeah. but I've just I, I will say I have never managed to get something that I thought was satisfactory out of color, but it is a great prototyping tool. If you want something quickly, then that's what you should use. Oh, I want pretty. <laughs> then color is the way to go. <laughs> no, video stitch. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Forget everything I just said. So the graphics card, can you, can you say what kind? Um, there are, so video stitch and other, and uh, Premiere, all use multi-threaded, um, can all multi-threaded graphics cards. Um, so I would recommend using more than one. The type, I mean, they list the types on their website that, that work best for their software, but I recommend Titan Blacks. They think that they're the best graphics cards on the market for what we do. Like if you're, if it's for games, if you're doing 3D, that's something else, but like I do video and video rendering. So like that's, I think that that's the best setup. Also, if you want to, Spring for Xeon, you know, dual socket motherboard. I wouldn't tell you not to. <laughs> All right, more questions. When you said uh, the cameras were dying, was it running out of space? I mean, uh... oh, so they have batteries, right? And I don't know if I have a picture of our cable. They have batteries and they run out of batteries. Even though they say they're supposed to shoot for four hours, they never do because GoPros are terribly unreliable. Sorry, GoPro. I know you're probably watching this on the internet. Um, so we actually bought 14, 15 foot uh, mini USB to USB cables and braided them into a giant heavy cable so I could actually plug in the camera all the time. Um, and that actually makes um, taking the, you know, you don't have to take all the SD cards out that way too. You, it's easier to transfer footage that way. So I'd highly recommend lots and lots and lots of USB cords. <laughs> All right, we got time for one more question. Make it a good one. I got one. All right, shoot. What is the biggest hurdle that you see between where you are and where you really think this should go? <laughs> the, hmm, the biggest hurdle is probably cameras. The, my camera is not a consumer product. Buying 14 what, $400 uh, GoPros to make 3D 360 video is kind of ridiculous. Um, and there are some mono cameras coming out, but I personally am not convinced by mono. Um, basically, you know, like having just one sphere for both of your eyes, um, which I, apparently not everyone knows is called mono, but that's what we're calling it. Um, so as cameras improve, and as these gentlemen over here are trying to prove is that you can get 3D out of fewer lenses. And once that happens, once, once we have, you know, just a tiny little ball and I can get, you know, s spherical stereo out of it, I think that that's the thing that will make it a consumer thing. And then I think software will follow that. Once you can, you know, compress it into a native format and edit it in a native format, those are all big hurdles too, but cameras is the first hurdle to get across, so. Yeah, and all if you right. want to build your own camera, if you have access to a bunch of GoPros, there is a, tutorial on our website that I wrote um, and it you know it's just hot glue and foam core and you can make a mono version or a 3d version and try it out fantastic big round of applause for everybody.